So um, welcome everybody to the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschke, I'm the director of the Siegel Center. We do bridge academia and professional theater, international and American theater. And today is a really great day in our calendar as the opening of the Penwell Voices Festival. For over 10 years we have had the privilege and honor to be part of that significant uh, literary festival, the most, uh, I think, significant one and important one in the US. Um, that uh, was created by Paul Oster and Salman Rushdie together with Michael Roberts um, to open what they call the tunnel vision of, uh, of America, the placing the importance that we should know what uh, people write about, think about in other countries. Um, their uh, statistics says 95% of all books are from the US, one you can buy here or from Great Britain, the rest five, half of it might be from France or Germany because there are some subsidies. So it's one or two books that comes from uh, uh, the other parts of the world, and this is not enough. Um, if you would be a musician, you would listen to music from all around the world. Actually, you would really want to uh, get influence and that you things you haven't heard of, and that inspires you, you combine it and you create something locally, but you do think globally. And I think this is a theater that also we should be doing, and I think the Gorky, which we invited this year to come, is a theater like this that really produces locally for the city of Berlin, but really has a global, um, span. Normally we have playwrights from co different continents, different countries, from Africa, Asia, from Australia, the, uh, Latin America, South America, mostly not from Britain, uh, and, uh, and, but uh, this time we said we're going to invite this theater to highlight an extraordinary work. It's what we think the theater that perhaps radiates most energy at the moment in Berlin, the youngest audiences, and a truly unique way of producing plays. We had a big evening last night where we talked about that kind of new way of producing text in collectives, uh, giving actors real agency. Uh, they are part of a creation and uh, they are enormously successful. As they said last night, they have about 40 plays in repertoire they can play at any time in any evening. They change uh, uh, the set and uh, they rehearse during the day and the evening shows they have created are out there. They have eight or nine weeks to create it, to produce it. And um, the Gorky has become a little name, a stamp, and I think we are really, really honored. It's the first time they come think, to the U.S., the first time all these plays get read here in the U.S. or in the Americas. And um, we translated half of them, the others, uh, uh, two of them, I think, uh, were already there. So it was a very big effort of many people, and I would really like to thank uh, the Gorky Theater, Christopher, who did so much work, who came here, he was here last night, but also Antje Ögel, who was a, a co-curator, of where is Antje? Um, over there, and also Michael Elida, who helped to make uh, this festival happen. So it is a very, very, very big honor to do this, and thank you all for coming. It's the first day, and tonight we're going to hear a play from Yael Ronan, who was actually here two years ago with a play, Common Ground, which was a fantastic work, I thought, the idea, if you look up what she did. And um, this will be a play, it will be about 40, 50 minutes, will be followed by a discussion uh, with uh, Dimitri, who is one of the great actors and one of the very prominent Berlin actor, actually, from the Gorky and filmmaker who is here and, and with us. So we talk about this work. Yael, con Yael could not come because of her work. And uh, really, uh, I hope you all will find time in New Berlin to go and see um, the work um, of um, the Gorky, afterwards we will go around the corner for a little reception in the archive bar, if you have time and you want to uh, uh, join us. It's on 36, between Phipps and Madison on the south side, just in the middle of the archive. And now it's time to take out your cell phones and just make sure it's off, I'll do the very same. We also would like to thank HowlRound. We are live streaming this event, and we are very uh, uh, happy that about that collaboration. Each of these uh, plays can be seen then, uh, later on. So thank you all for coming. And now, A Walk on the Dark Side by Yael Ronan. I'll happily start at the beginning. And the beginning was the singularity, and around 13.8 billion years ago, it exploded, and within one Planck second, so 10 to the power of negative 43, so 0 0.0000000, 42 zeros, and then one, it created space and time. When the universe was 100 quintillionths of, quintillionths of a second old, so 10 to the power of negative 32, hyperinflation began, and the universe grew by a factor of 10 to the power of 26. Uh, to visualize that in a billionth of a trillionth of a second, 
a meter grew to the size of 1,000 galaxies. The inflation stopped again, and within one second, uh, and for the next 300,000 years, everything was actually everything. Every particle of our known universe was connected to every other particle in a perfect, absolutely harmonious state of highly concentrated energy. This then cooled down and the quarks started to interact with each other and bonded to form atoms. Atoms formed molecules which formed gas clouds, which formed stars, which began the process of nuclear fusion, burned out, exploded, and the resulting stardust fused to form planets. Uh, but the more matter concentrated in the expanding universe, the more empty space was formed between it. And surprisingly, completely empty space has its own constant energy, which is extremely tiny. Einstein found it when he saw that his equations were somehow wrong, and so he introduced uh, the cosmological constant for this constant space energy in his theory of relativity, and that's 0 0.0000126 zeros, and then only a one. Unimaginably small. But the more empty space there is, so the more big. No one is listening to you anymore. I can't put it any more simply. Do you know that feeling, like when when people tell you about something they're totally enthusiastic about, which they know a lot about? I know a lot when they do pure research. Yeah, sure. They talk and talk and talk, and you listen. But at some point, you realize you're not following. You're standing there, and you have no idea what you're talking about. Um, let's do it with a show of hands. Um, how many of you, like who here, stopped listening to what he was saying? Like, don't be shy. It's in, yeah, it's in, feel free. Raise your hand. Uh, it's totally fine. Stand up for your ignorance. Um, I know it takes a bit of effort to admit when you don't get something, but that's okay. I'm a scientist. I'm a quantum physicist. So I know both sides of these situations. Uh, and in conversations that fail like this, I've noticed one thing really interesting that you somehow feel guilty. But if you really think about it properly, it should be exactly the other way around. Because you can't do anything about it. There's no way you can do anything to understand better. But the other person can do something. They can find a better explanation for what they're explaining. Um, I work on science communication a lot. It's a lot of fun for me explaining science to other people, and it's also a lot of fun helping other scientists, like my brother here, to make themselves understood and explain their totally fascinating research uh, to other people. It's actually really important, because science work is publicly funded, and so taxpayers should understand what their money is, ha what's happening with their money. That's why I make these YouTube videos and write science books for kids from 7 to 11, and I have my TED Talk. Yes. Taxpayers love you, fine. So maybe I rushed a bit too far ahead, and I obviously overtaxed most people here intellectually. Maybe I'm better off starting at the end. We live in dark times. Nice. I spend my life working for the dark side, which makes up 95% of the universe. Very good. So allow me to familiarize you with the most promising theories of the dark side of our universe. I'll keep it simple. We are dealing with two dark entities. Let's call them the Dark Brothers. <laughs> OK. The Dark Brothers. There's Dark Matter. That's you. Dark Matter. And his evil, restless brother, Dark Energy. I'll play him. And these two Dark Brothers are fighting a cosmic battle of epic proportions. Dark Matter's gravity wants to pull everything together. It's not actually gravity, but a completely different force field. Gravity is actually too weak to hold galaxies together, and without the force field of dark matter, the stars would just fly away. Dark matter is strange. He's very lonely. He doesn't interact with anything else. He just doesn't like doing things with other particles in the standard electromagnetic spectrum. He's all mysterious. But really, he just makes a big deal of himself. We can't even prove he exists. We strongly assume that he exists, and for years we looked for evidence of this introverted, mysterious, dense brother who does a lot to bring things together and keep them intact and organized. And his wild, energetic brother, Dark Energy, keeps messing up this whole boring order, and because of him, the expansion of the universe accelerates faster and faster and faster every day. Yeah, to understand Dark Energy, we need to understand that large spaces in our universe are completely empty. But Dark Energy is very successful. It's a weak force, but 
very sick. I mean, you can imagine dark energy as a, as a king, as a, a conqueror, as a, as a god of emptiness. Uh, his motivation, his vision, his aim is to fill the whole universe with himself. And because of ingratiating egoists like him, we now live in dark times. And it wasn't always like this. At the start of our universe, everything was once perfect. There was only one harmonious, creative, dense force. The more this force concentrated and grew, the more empty space it created. And then he comes along, squeezes, kicks, and pushes himself into everywhere with his pathetic force. Everything he did was only based on my work. And of course, vacuousness is super successful in an increasingly vacuous universe, and it spreads exponentially with its sexy energy, so that nothing has any meaning anymore, and will soon live in a completely dark universe growing into infinity, in which nothing of real significance can ever be created again. And the worst thing is, he was born because of a mistake Daddy Einstein made. His strength is a virtual bubble, but because at some point we noticed the universe was getting emptier, people totally fell in love with this mistake because he can plant a lot of things around his vacuous YouTube channel. However, my greatness is solid as steel and proven, since my research into the echo of the oldest stars in the visible universe actually proved dark matter exists, which we can hear. You want to know what it sounds like? I will get a Nobel Prize for it. I will get a Nobel Prize. So you're my girlfriend, and I'm picking me up from the hospital in your car. From the hospital? Yes. Uh, okay, fine. Um, and that's my car. That's your car. But what kind of car is it? Whatever you want. A Jaguar XGTOTS Coupe. You can't afford it, but you can have a Honda if you like. <laughs> then they have a Honda, and we have a Tesla. We can afford it. We've only had it for two months, and it still has that new car smell. I'll drive. You can't drive. I can drive. I just choose not to. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> We're going on vacation. Just the weekend. I'm very busy, but we can go away for the weekend to celebrate my prize. To the spree ball. Spree ball? You wanted something close by. It was the only thing I could get at such short notice. If you have a problem with that, I, cancel. I didn't say I have a problem. But you sounded like it was a problem. I don't have a problem. I am very happy to go for a weekend in the spree ball. And we're joining you. Family vacation. It's only a weekend. And if it were a family holiday, I never would have invited her. First of all, she's my girlfriend. And second of all, you don't know she's coming. It's a surprise. I love surprises. But I can't go on vacation like this. This isn't leisure wear. I need to change. I didn't know I was coming either. I didn't even pack. I bought you something fancy. Can you please help me? I don't know what to wear. Did the nurse give you my baskets? Oh, those were baskets. Yeah, I wondered what those were. I made you some baskets. Wow, thank you. Yeah, well, they're not just for you, but you can have one, you know, or a few, if you want. I, I didn't know you could make baskets. It's not complicated. I, I can show you if you want, but it's not very interesting. It's just something to keep us busy. So first you have to really concentrate. Then you don't have to think about it. Then it gets more and more automatic, but then all the thoughts come back. Crocheting is better. You have to keep counting the stitches. What stitches? In crochet. You look good. Thank you. I feel good. You look tan. I was away. On vacation? No, no, I was, I was on tour uh, with my TED Talk. Someone sent it? You can tell me the truth. I won't be angry if you went on vacation while I was in the hospital. I wasn't on holiday, I was working. And anyway, I thought maybe it'd be good for me to get away. They told me it would be better if I didn't visit you. Better for whom? Better for you. That's what they said? Yes. Did they? Yep, it was better for me. I made a lot of new friends. I saw that. There were a lot of people saying goodbye. Yes, I had to give so many goodbye kisses. And that big guy with the beard looked like a really good friend. <laughs> oh yeah, he was my um, basket making partner. <laughs> he wove from here and I wove from there. And with the big baskets, we wove until we came together. We got so close. <laughs> and the, that skinny guy who hugged you, was, was he in basket weaving too? No, that was my intern. He studied me. Studied you? Yeah. There was this whole group of students. They were studying me. 
I'm interesting. In what way did they find you interesting? In general, I'm a very interesting case. <laughs> yeah, I can tell. Uh, how, how many interns were studying you? Four. Okay. And, and how does it work? Do they, do they all study you at once? Or, or one and then the other? Or individually? That blonde guy you kissed by the door, was he an intern too? No, he was my doctor. I love him. He's great. It looks like you got on well. Yeah. Really intimate. He probably examined you too. Yeah, he mainly examined me. He was my doctor. <laughs> he really understands me. Sure, I mean, that is his job. You probably talked a lot. You probably told him a lot. He probably knows a lot about you. And so um, these examinations, they're not just verbal, they're, they're physical, too? <coughs> yes, physical. And what, what, what kind of physical treatment? Mm. Felt my skin, looked into my chest, checked my tongue, and stimulated my reflexes, my reactions, found my triggers and stimulation points, tensed my muscles, and relaxed. Relaxed and reached the pain. Should I stop for a moment? Should, should we stop the car? Yes, but not here. Drive off the road and stop okay. next to the trees. Okay, okay. okay. I'm the hitchhiker and you're the truck driver. Okay. <laughs> okay, so you take me to the woods, break me, and kill me. Uh, how, how, how do I kill you? It doesn't matter. Uh, do you mind if I just rape you? Mm, okay, but you have to leave me lying there and run away. Oh, oh, it doesn't happen in the car? Of course not. I run away, you catch me, we fight for a little bit, and then you fuck me. Preferably under a tree. Which, which tree? It doesn't matter. But, but can we can we just leave out the running bit? I, I have this corn. So. Okay, we'll go slow. Anything else? Yeah, no, no biting, no kicking in the balls, and, and don't rip my t-shirt for you. Okay. What are you doing, Mr. Truck Driver? What does it look like I'm doing? <laughs> Let me out! Let me out! Help! Help! You need to be in the right lane. I know. It doesn't look like that. You want to drive? I have nothing against not driving. I don't want to drive. Well then, can you please close the window? I'm cold. I need air. I can't think. Then get some, think, and close the window. I'm cold. Is it going to be like this the whole time? Because if it is, I prefer to go home. I'm not in the mood for this party if you're going to be like this all weekend. I won't be. I just need a little bit of time to calm down, and then I'll be fine. Why do you have to calm down? You got what you wanted. He's not here without him the way you wanted, so why are you the one who needs to calm down? Because I expect you to back me up in situations like these. Don't start playing good cop now and making me the bad cop. So I have to agree with you automatically even when you're wrong, so you don't look like the bad cop in front of our son? Oh, I didn't say you're not allowed to have your own opinion. You did, that's exactly what you said. He cut open the neighbor's cat. He slaughtered an animal. That should bother you. He didn't slaughter it, he was operating on it. That's what he said. The cat is dead. He killed the cat. He opened up a cat to see what's inside. As a causal result, the cat died. <laughs> but he didn't cut it open with the intention of killing it. There's a big difference in my opinion. So it's okay? Maybe give him a reward instead of punishing him. Do you have any idea how many frogs my brother and I cut open as kids? That's not the same. Why? Because one's a cat and the others were frogs? That's racist. He cut open the neighbor's cat, not the neighbor. I see it all as a sign of healthy curiosity. A curious, curious child on the way to becoming a great doctor or scientist. Or a psychopath. What if he becomes one of these American kids who goes to his American school with an American machine gun and kills his American friends and American parents? How could he become an American kid? So much bullshit in one sentence. I don't even know where to start disagreeing with you. Do you really think that there's a murderous American psycho hiding in our sweet little boy? Do you? No, but... If he doesn't understand what he did wrong, then maybe something's wrong, and we're doing something wrong. And you know what's really wrong? When something's wrong, when I tell him he can't come on holiday as punishment, and you contradict me. I don't see the link between what he did and not bringing him to a family occasion where my prize is being celebrated. Is it about punishing him or me? So we should just pretend nothing happened and let him come so you can celebrate your prize. I didn't want to celebrate shit. I never asked to celebrate. This whole weekend was your idea. I don't even see the point to go away to meet my brother. Can you please slow down? 
Do you want to kill us? You are only allowed to go 100 here. Fuck, are you trying to kill us? When we're back, I want us to talk about the boarding school. I don't see the point in talking to you about the boarding school. Well, I don't see the point in talking to you in general. Fine, let's not talk. Great idea. You know what? You should get a prize for that. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I just wanted to say we're on our way. Uh, I had to take a little detour to pick up a surprise. Oh, that's sweet. I love surprises. Yes, it's very sweet. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> it's Magda. Uh, hi, Magda. I thought she was in the hospital. I was relieved today. <laughs> Congratulations. So I picked her up and thought I'd just take her along. That's Great! Yes, great. So, see you soon? Yes, see you soon. Did you know anything about that? I had no idea. Is she, I don't know, is, is she okay now? I don't know. But should we call somebody to ask? Ask what and who? Maybe she needs someone to watch her. Maybe she needs to be under observation. Maybe we need to make things safe. Make things safe? I mean, the woman ate glass. <laughs> Maybe you eat a sandwich with avocado so it goes down easier, but should we stop to buy plastic cups? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, she can still eat the windows. No, it's probably double glazing. I don't think it's easy to break those. <laughs> well, take care of your glasses so that she won't eat them. Hello? Hello? Hello, it's me, David. Oh, hi. Hey. I just wanted to say I'm already here. I'm looking forward to seeing you all. Oh, you're in Berlin? No, I'm here, in the Scribal. My battery is nearly dead. I'll see you soon. Bye. Did you invite David? I haven't talked to him since the funeral. Well, then who invited him? Maybe my brother. He loves surprises. Maybe we should just cancel the whole thing. No. We decided to have fun, and it will be fun. <laughs> we decided to celebrate, and we will celebrate. Because you deserve it. Yeah, that's true. So basically, my team and I from Arizona Tech are trying to listen to radio waves. It's very hard with all the cosmic background radiation, as if you were trying to, uh, standing in a hurricane, trying to hear a fly's wings beat. And then we find these first generation stars, 78 megahertz. Are, are you allowed to drink alcohol? I'm not pregnant. Now I'll explain to you why it really did interact with dark matter. That's what the prize was for anyway. Uh, I developed a theory about dark matter, which makes up 80% of the matter in the universe, but is invisible. Uh, let's imagine it's like my subconscious. And I predicted it must be extremely cold because it doesn't form any bonds with other matter. But its coldness is infectious. And if we find the oldest stars in the universe when it was still extremely hot, these signals would have to be weaker because they were being held back by the mass of gold. A few months ago, astronomers picked up radio waves that are 13.5 billion years old, and they are weaker than everyone expected, and that proves my theory and will now make me really famous. So, pretty funky stuff. Cheers. Yeah, it looks like they might buy it. Google wants to buy you. Cheers. Um, we want to do a lahaim. Uh, we're in the middle of a conversation. Yes, but we want to do a lahaim. Everybody's ready. It would be an exit for info structure, but it's not that much of an exit. It's the best option. Many, many thanks for being here with um, him, Emmanuel, his prize. <laughs> We're so grateful. Uh, Emmanuel, do you want to say a few words? Uh, yes. Uh, so, as Mario already said, thanks for being here, uh, for celebrating this revolutionary achievement with me, which has catapulted me onto the physicist Mount Olympus. Uh, I'm happy to see Every one of you, even if some of you are a surprise. I only wish my son was here, but he's not. Yes. <laughs> he wanted to have a sleepover with his friends. It was really important to him. So my son's not here. Cheers. Cheers. That was it? Yes. Okay. Then I, I would like to say something. Um, we have a lot to celebrate. We can be so thankful. Uh, first, we are alive and healthy, and it seems that we all want to stay alive. We all made it. We're all here. Except for death. He's not.
not here, he's dead. True, he's dead. And my son's not here either. But he's still alive? Of course. <laughs> he's only having a sleepover with his friends. Cheers. I would like to take the opportunity. Uh, actually, I would like to say something too. We are so happy you're back. We miss you so much. I'd like to take the opportunity to say a few words about Dad, if I may. I'm sure, Emmanuel, that he can see you wherever he is right now and that he's very proud of you. Whenever we saw each other in the last year, he talked about you a lot. And no matter how lonely and sick he was in the end, <laughs> he always said, I don't need Emmanuel at my side. I'm happier that my son doing something great for humanity. He can't and doesn't want to do anything for me anymore. I wish he could see he was right. I know it hasn't always been easy between us. Between us three, there was friction. Things that didn't run smoothly, that weren't easy, big challenges. We didn't talk for years. But I'd like you to know, there are no half-brothers for me. You're my brothers. You're the only family I have in this world, and I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry that I left right after the funeral, that I abandoned you, but I followed you from afar. I saw what you achieved. I, I saw your TED Talk, two million hits. Wow. You must have been really annoyed about that car. I really want you to know, I had no idea you wanted to give it to me. I was never interested in plastic. It's, it's okay. okay. It's, it's water. And, and I want you to have it. it here's the key. Forget it. Forget it. It's, it's art. I'm serious. I don't want it. I know what the car means to you. I want you to have it. I know you'll be there. Thanks. He's really happy about that. Don't eat that. Money. <laughs> I also wanted to toast to you and to your PhD, that you're still working on it after all these years. <laughs> Soon there will be more than one doctor in the house. Uh, I'm a professor. <laughs> doctor and professor. No wonder you have such an extraordinary child. Seriously, one look at Morris and you know he's different from other kids. <laughs> Somehow special. tell you how happy it made me when I read about the prize. You didn't have an easy year. You went through a few things. Apart from dad, a few other things got out of control. It seems everything's going well for you now, though. <laughs> and Magda, that's your name, right? I have heard so much about you. I think we met briefly at the funeral. I wasn't at the funeral. I was in the nut house. <laughs> Why did you even invite him? What's the deal with the car? Nothing. I don't, I don't care about the fucking car. He wears sunglasses inside. Who does he think he is? Stevie Wonder? Fuck him and his, I want to talk about dad. Dad this. Dad said. Dad was so proud of you. Dad, dad, dad. I didn't know that they were so close. No, they didn't see each other for 18 years. He was 12 the last time we saw him. When my father got sick, probably some defect in his brain burned out his synapses, and then he started with it. I have to find David. I have to see him bring David. You know he gave him 400 grand in the last two years? He just unburdened all his shit on me. But now we have the car. Fuck the car. Well, why didn't he have contact for 18 years? Forget it. It was complicated. Uh, I like complicated. Oh, right. Your dad had an affair, right? David is between affair, you and Emmanuel? Affair, affair. It wasn't an affair. Probably a one-night stand when he was drunk with some Israelis pretty randomly. She decided to keep the baby, and he had this idea of doing the right thing and support her financially. I mean, it, it wasn't a secret. My mother knew about it, but instead of splitting up like a normal couple, they made me. Thanks. We, we always knew we had a half-brother somewhere in Israel, but I think my father had no contact with David's mother apart from the money. She got religious, married an ultra-Orthodox Jew, and had like 10 kids with him. 10? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's what they do there. I don't know how much I don't know how much you know about ultra orthodox Jews. Nothing. Tell me. Well, whatever. They they belong to this special movement. So it, something between the Amish and the Jewish version of the Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I don't know the exact history of David's family. I only know they were very poor and very strict. So I don't know if there was violence or abuse. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, David ran away when he was twelve, probably after someone beat the shit out of him. And it seemed like there was no way back into that community once you've left the religion, for then you're dead. So somehow he managed it. He contacted my father, and my father went to Israel and brought him home. Then he, he came back with this creature, this alien who only spoke Yiddish, as if he came from another planet. Just, just imagine. He, he had never seen a TV before in his life. He talked to it. He sat there the whole time like this. He couldn't deal, that's the way he sat in front of the TV. He couldn't deal with girls and women at all. He didn't know how to behave around them. He was afraid to talk to our mother because he was never allowed to be alone with women. He wasn't even allowed to look at them. He just couldn't deal with anything. He was afraid to talk to our mother or even to look at her. He couldn't handle anything really. It was, it was as, as, as if someone, he, he had grown up in the forest raised by wolves and we had to share a room with him. I was eight, Emmanuel was 14, Three boys in one room, you can imagine what went on. He thought he'd be struck by lightning if someone masturbated near him, and Emmanuel masturbated every night before he went to sleep. <laughs> and before David went to sleep, he just banged his head on the wall until it bled. I, I remember I woke up and saw the blood stains on the wall. To this day, I don't know what my father was thinking because this boy obviously had problems. I mean, we were kids. We were scared of him and we were disgusted by him. And, and we got on his nerves the way kids do, but my father just forced us to play with him, so we played with him. Truth or dare, except with us there was no truth, only dare, and we decided what, and we made him do stuff. And then for fun, I said, I said it totally as a joke, I said, jump out the window, and he jumped out the window, second floor. We thought he was dead. We were kids, we, we panicked, we didn't know what to do. We didn't say anything, we just hoped somebody would find him and call the ambulance, and that was the last time we saw him. We never visited the hospital. I don't even know if my father did. We were sure he was dead and that nobody wanted to tell us. And after a month, my father told us that he was released from hospital and went back to Israel, but we thought he was lying and we were scared to ask because I was scared I would go to jail. <coughs> <laughs> what? Hmm. That's, that's all we have to say? Hmm? No idea. What, I mean, what do you think? Hmm. Where, where are you going? Um, to the balcony to smoke. Oh, that's why you quit. I started again. Everyone smokes in hospital, and I'm not pregnant anymore. What's what's the problem? Can I join you? No. Sure. I'm going to the balcony for a smoke. Nothing's up. Already done? That wasn't even ten minutes. It took you longer to change your clothes. I've had enough. I want to leave. Oh, where? Home. You want us to sneak out from your own party? It was a wonderful idea and an enjoyable evening, but I want to go home now. <laughs> that would be funny. <laughs> I'm not joking. I know, and that is what is so funny. I want to leave and I can't drive. Can you just drive me? Oh, try it driving. Could you please just drive me home? You can come back if you want, I don't mind. Oh, well, of course. Do you want some rescue remedy? What? A homeopathic remedy against panic attacks. I'm not having a panic attack. Do they help? <laughs> Who? The drops. Of course not. They're <laughs> homeopathic. <laughs> Open your mouth, it doesn't hurt. It doesn't help either. Well, of course not, they're homeopathic. <laughs> When are you taking drops against panic attacks? Since I've been having panic attacks. Since when do you have panic attacks? Since I stopped taking the antidepressants. You were on antidepressants? <laughs> sure. Why? Because I'm depressed. Why are you depressed? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe because I'm so lonely. They both look good. They're happy and in love. They're over it. It looks like it brought them closer together. Don't you think? I don't know. It's not easy for a couple to lose a child.
child. Being pregnant in the ninth week isn't a baby. Technically, it's not even an embryo. It was this small. They should try again. Are you insane? He should be happy he got out of it. He's not even 25, and he has this whole promising life ahead of him. And she's, she's mentally ill. She ate glass. You said it yourself. She killed his baby. Embryo. Personally, I doubt that she was really pregnant. Why would she lie about being pregnant? Who knows? Why do people lie? That's a good question. Why do people lie? No idea. Why? Why? I don't know. Tell me. Why? Maybe they have something to hide. If you want to ask me something, ask. But stop wasting my time. What did he mean that you had a tough year? That things got out of control? David? No idea what he wanted to say. That's David. He's fucked up. I love him, but with his history, it's a miracle that he halfway functions as a normal person and all. He told me he sold his company to Google. So that's what he told you. And you believe it? He's a pathological liar. There is no company. 25 is not so early. We just started too late. Don't you wish sometimes we had another child? What's wrong with you today? You want to send the child we already have to boarding school so you can write your PhD, so please. But if Moritz dies, at least it's just not the two of us. <laughs> Why would Moritz die? Children die. It happens. Maybe a cat will cut him open because it wants to see what's inside. <laughs> You're sick. Did I say something wrong? No. So, what happened? Nothing. I'm fine. Did you bring the ropes? You should have bought them. Sorry, I I, I saw uh, uh, a hammock outside. I could use the ropes from that. Forget but, it. Okay. Why didn't you come visit me? I was there. Why? You didn't want to. I told you, I was there. Why? You weren't there. You didn't give a shit about me. All of you, your fucking brother, your fucking hypocritical family, you don't give a fuck if I'm You know that isn't that. true. You asked me not to come. I did not ask you not to come. I was there, and you didn't want to talk to me. You didn't want to tell me what happened. You said, it's none of your business. And you told your doctors you didn't want me to come back. The doctors said that, not me. And you believed them. You abandoned me. Bullshit. You didn't even think of me. How can you say that? I thought of nothing but you. I was worried about you. I nearly lost my mind. Then why did you abandon me? Why did you abandon me? Why did you I, abandon I didn't, me? I didn't abandon you. I'm here. You abandoned me. You don't love me anymore, I love right? you. How can you say that? How can you say that I don't love you? I love you so much. I want, I want to marry you. Let's get married. Let's make a baby. Yeah, let's make a baby. Make a baby. <laughs> Why are you still awake? I quit smoking, so I can't sleep. Ah, you know we're connected. I don't know if it's connected, but it sounds good. I quit smoking. Mazel tov. I'm going to make myself a tea. Do you want one? Maybe later. But you can stick with me a bit. I wanted to tell you how I appreciate what you did for him, for Papa, how you took care of him. I loved him a lot. We had a special connection. We had good talks. He's a very special man. He was. Yeah. It was hard to see how that disease changed him. Last time I talked to him, he begged me to get sleeping pills so we could Yes. <laughs> I can understand him being helpless. And not only that you can't go to the toilet by yourself or wash yourself, you can't even kill yourself. Even though, sorry. It's okay. I didn't mean to. It's okay. Yeah. He felt guilty that he was a burden just when you were trying to get your doctorate. I wanted to help him. He was grateful for what you did for him. I wanted to help. Tennis tomorrow?
Oh, shit. Fuck. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Did I break your glasses? That's fine. I'm so sorry. Uh, there's nothing to see anyway. You're in really great shape. How did you get so good? Have you been practicing secretly? I've been working out. You can see that. You look fantastic. And healthy. I'm really happy that you're taking such good care of yourself. Uh, yeah. Of course, it wasn't an easy time for you with Magda in the hospital and all that shit. I think it's great that you understood that you need to look after yourself, take time for yourself, move your career forward. That tour you did with that TED Talk, dude, really cool. Cambridge, Princeton, Yale, Berkeley, crazy. I never get invited to those things. I thought you hated my TED Talks. Are you insane? Uh, I'm sorry if you thought that. No, maybe I should have said that you oversimplify facts. Maybe. But that's what's brilliant about it. Uh, it's simply brilliant. You're brilliant. And I mean that. The amazing thing is that you don't even have to go too much effort to achieve that. You're naturally talented. That's what it is. I hope you know that if you put time and ener energy into it, then the sky's the limit for you. Ah, oh, come on, stop. I mean it, seriously. I'm going to say something now, and I'll never say it again, so enjoy the moment. You ready? Mm -hmm. You're the genius, and I'm so incredibly proud of you. Look, what you've already achieved in your career in only three months. Sure, I mean, she was in the hospital. You are more focused than usual, but just imagine. Yeah, no, forget it. What? Please don't get me wrong. She's a very special woman. You two have a passionate relationship. She has serious medical problems, and you just have to ask yourself if you're really able to provide the help she needs. You have to be honest with yourself and her. Will you really be able to be there for her if it happens again? Because it will happen. I love her. That's great. Love is nice, but you have to think. I'm going to marry her. <coughs> you're going to what? I want to marry her. I want us to have another baby. Did you decide this or her? What's that supposed to mean? Was it your idea or hers to get I, married? I asked her. Voluntarily, she didn't put any pressure on you. What do you want? I, how are you right now? Are you angry with her? You have every reason to be angry. Do you feel that she went behind your back, manipulated you? How are you? How do you think I am? Shit. Uh, two months ago, the woman I love tried to kill herself and I don't even know why, and she won't tell me. It's none of my business, because of course I'm angry. She killed our baby, so just like that. So if this is what you want to hear, yes, I hate her for what she did. You have every reason to. You don't have to prove anything to anyone. No one will judge you if you leave. By the way, were you stupid enough to invite David? But why would I invite David? Then who invited him? Not me. Magda, can you put some lotion on my back? <laughs> yeah. <sighs> good. Good, Magda, good. Do you want some hands? Uh, a bit. On my shoulders. Shoulders, shoulders, shoulders. one at 
15, I fucked up that one. I ended up in the hospital. Too deep? Hit a vein. Wouldn't stop bleeding. Funny story, actually. I like funny stories, Tom. Okay, so I did it in the school toilets with a razor blade. I usually stop the blood with toilet paper, but this time it wouldn't stop. So I bandaged my leg with my shirt. It still wouldn't stop. Pressed my sweater on it, um, my trousers. It wouldn't stop. Everything was soaked in blood. Uh, and uh, so I'm sitting on the toilet in my underwear until everything is just soaked in blood. Everything, my clothes, my skin, the floor, the everything. The whole time, I just have this one panicky thought in my head. Clean up this fucking mess. So I try to go into the other toilet um, in my underwear to get some more toilet paper. I open the door, and right then, a girl comes towards me. She's standing there, staring at me, this naked thing covered in blood. And I don't know what to do. And you know what I said to her? What? I said, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> and she says, Fine. And then she got sick. Oh my god, I, I was picked up by the ambulance and everyone thought that I wanted to kill myself, but of course I didn't want to kill myself. I mean, of course I wanted to kill myself, but not like that, you know? Like, I only cut myself to stop myself from killing myself because if I hadn't cut myself, I would have had to kill myself. Do you follow? <laughs> I mean, if I hadn't cut myself, I, I mean, if I didn't cut myself, I would have had to kill myself because how else was I gonna put up with everything? I mean, myself, that I was fading away, that everything fades away, that nothing will exist anymore, nothing. This one big black hole that I can't even describe it in words. I know the feeling. I wanted my suicide to be clean, not this bloody lump of pork in a dirty Controlled splitting of the ribs, or, or drowning like Virginia Woolf. A girl from the hospital, Nancy, my true love, she tried that way. Um, she went to Denmark to the to the Wadden Sea, went into the ocean at low tide, and waited for it to come in. And what came along? A group of Japanese tourists. <laughs> then she swallowed razor blades in the hospital, survived. Pill overdose, survived. Swallowed glass, didn't survive. Two survived. She came up with the craziest self-harm method. She poured hot oil on her chest at lunch. Oh, she was totally out of control. I mean, what can you do with a kid like that, you know? No, seriously, what, what, what can you do with a kid like that? They put Nancy, my true love, in timeout, solitary confinement. There's just a bed and a piss pot and a plexiglass window in the door. When you lie there, people just stare at you through the window from the corridor like they care about it too. At some point, time and space just stop existing and you start to leave your body. You see your body from above, lying there so vulnerable, so weak. How long were you in? One days. But what I wanted to say too, um, what if a kid like that jumps out of bed in timeout and bangs their head on the wall until it bleeds? What do you do then? What do you do with those suicide states? Do you sleep? Artificial coma, force feeding? You know, then I stopped cutting myself and I tried to fit in, but not in my head. Imagining where and how it would be on my body. It's funny talking to you about this. I mean, people are not supposed to talk about this. It scares them. Not me. I was in a home for crazy kids when I was three. Really? What was it like? Fine. I learned a lot. I thought that once I was in there, I would never come out. And here I am. I got out. <laughs> I'm always happy.
happy to meet another suicide kid. You can smell each other. And how was it this time in the hospital? It was okay. The pills are better. <laughs> Were you angry he didn't visit you? Oh, he was there once. That was all that I wanted. I meant Emmanuel. You were angry. He didn't come, right? <clears throat> you have every reason to be angry. It was his baby, right? Well, you really don't know whose baby it was. He was at your place just before he tried to kill himself. What was going on? Did he tell you? I know. Don't worry. I won't tell anyone if you don't want me to. I'm on your side. You deserve to be loved and accepted. Grapes? Anyone? The green ones aren't that sweet, but the red ones are delicious. Grapes? Magda? No thanks. I'll have some. Um. Just the one. Swimming. What else? Have fun. <clears throat> I wanted to thank you for yesterday's conversation. My pleasure. About the thing with the. Um, Don't worry. I'm about the same thing. About the. Pills. What? what? The pills you gave Papa. Tacos? If I had the balls, I would have done it myself. <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> okay. I just want you to know that I'm on your side. If it had been a manual, I would have loved to fuck him over for that, but it wasn't a manual, it was you. So I'm going to take care of you. I swear. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. Okay. Hi. Hi. How was tennis? I won. Great. How was swimming? Oh, we didn't go swimming. We talked. It was very interesting. Right, Magda? Very interesting. Really? Oh, you said you wanted to go swimming. The water was too cold. Where is right? Where is Magda? Uh, in the water. What? Are, are you crazy? Uh, alone? Yes! Are you insane? There she is! Oh, well, Matthias is looking everywhere for you. I'm here. Good. There you are! Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a lunar eclipse tonight, but let's watch it together, right? Yes, I'll get my telescope. Oh, that's not necessary. I have mine with me, too. <laughs> I love moons. <laughs> Besides the two dark brothers, there is another even darker energy it, entity in our universe, a black hole. To be completely honest, we know nothing about it. We don't even know how much we don't know. We know that Papa Einstein invented them, and his theory was, if a supermassive object is forced into a tiny radius of movement, eventually, eventually it will create a rupture in the space-time. When a star has no more energy, it collapses in on itself and contracts back to a tiny point and feeds on the energy of other things. It's so dense and so strong that not even light can escape its power, which is why we can't see a black hole. We don't know who or what this is, but we can see its destructive effects on others. Whole star systems can revolve around black holes without knowing who's controlling them, 
until every particle is torn apart. A black hole isn't actually dangerous. It only rips you apart and eats you up when you're close to it. It feeds on information and stores it inside itself. And because a hole like that is such a rude pig, when it eats, it burps and vomits a surge of information into space mixed with toxic gas and deadly radiation. So it's really impossible to grasp grasp is what happens inside this black hole. Inside it, there's no difference between the past, the present, and the future. It's completely deranged. When we start thinking about what goes on inside it, we find results that are so strange, so confused, so unfathomable, so ridiculous that they leave the laws of logic at absurdum. What do you want? Strange mount. Yeah, I thought so too. Um, it's a new bridge from Skywatcher. Um, only came out this year, but it has the huge advantage that it doesn't shake much. I mean, the focus around them is smooth as butter, too. 12 inch, 24 millimeter illumination, parabolic primary mirror. 88%? Uh, 94. Visible difference. 1 to 10 magnification, 1 and a quarter inch reduction. It's a bit short, don't you think? Yeah, I wanted one with a short focal length, so for looking at deep sky objects. And you really brought this massive thing? Uh, once you get used to it, because mostly I look at the weak galaxies and the details of the hydrogen clouds. You know all about that. How much you got in the database? Well, 42,900 objects. We can control them all with the touch of a button. So, uh, who wants to go first? your baby or if I didn't know whose it was. What did you say? Nothing. Did you tell him that? Of course not. What else did he say? That I deserve to be loved and respected. I think he's right. <laughs> I want to tell Matthias the truth. Now that he wants to marry me, I don't want to keep any secrets from him anymore. Did they castrate your brain in there so <laughs> you can't control the shit coming out of your mouth anymore at all or what? You won't say anything. Not to Matthias. Not to anyone else either. No one will believe you anyway. Everyone knows you're sick in the head, a serious danger to yourself and others. Everyone knows it was irresponsible to release you after three months. I'm not a strong man, but if you dare to open your big mouth, all it needs is two phone calls, and you'll be back in solitary confinement, <coughs> where you can spend the rest of your meaningless life regretting that your glass eating didn't work. Okay, then. Do it. Try. Can I see? Yours. I'm going to Matthias. seriously allowing yourself to be manipulated by that psycho. Don't you know that he... Shut up. Don't you want an idiot out of me? Do you really think that I'm that stupid just because I didn't say anything? If you would have at least had the decency to try and hide it properly, how stupid you must think I am. You didn't even bother to delete all your disgusting messages. I don't. Shut up! And there is no moon! I just want to know that it is over. It's over? I swear. And that they will never happen again. They will never happen again. And yet you had nothing to do with her suicide. It was her decision. The mosquitoes are eating me alive out here. I'm going to go back to my room. And they're eating you because you're so sweet. Just look.
if you weren't swaying around so much, you could see the moon, too. That's amazing, really. Thank you. I'm sorry if I hurt you yesterday. I didn't mean to. It's no big deal. I really didn't. I don't want you to be angry with me. You're both really important to me. I wish we were closer. Sometimes I have the feeling that you're still kind of angry. I'm not angry. I'm not angry because... I'm not angry! I'm not angry either. Then no one's angry. That's good. I mean, I always admired the way you two are, how you stick together no matter what happens. I wish we were like that too. Us three. Yeah. You were always able to let everything go, forgive each other, stay so close. How you got over the whole thing with Master. What thing? That he's fucking you. What do you want, you freak? He's fucking you. What? He's fucking you. He's fucking What do you want? Why do you think she tried to kill herself? Ah! Ah, my watch! Jesus, my eye! You, you broke my watch! You cut my I didn't mean eye. to! It was the watch! Look, my glass is broken! I didn't mean to! It was the watch! That asshole, it was a new watch. He broke it with his face. <laughs> what happened? Forget it. What did he say to you? Nothing. Fuck. I won't, I won't even repeat his sick bullshit. About Emmanuel and Magda? What? Emmanuel and Magda. You really didn't know? What? I wondered why it didn't bother you. Why what didn't bother me? Their little thing. You think, didn't, did you think it was weird that she always went to visit her parents? That she was? He had to go to conferences? No, 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 no. She was visiting her parents. Exactly. And he had to go to conferences. They were always traveling. I'll wait for you at the petrol station. You're the truck driver, and I'm the hitchhiker. You want to rape me and kill me. You drive off the road. We struggle. I run away. You catch me. Tie me to a tree and fuck me. You thought you were something special. Who told you that? Was it David? No. Sadly, I had to read it for myself. Does it really surprise you? You know your brother. You know about his other. What did you think? That he would leave her alone because you're his brother? You really shouldn't be so surprised about who he is. You know him better than me. It doesn't matter. It's over now. It doesn't need to bother you anymore. This was a uh, modern reading. Yeah. So Yal Ronan, as I said earlier, um, couldn't join us. She's in Berlin working, but we have Dimitri with us, who was part of the cast and who developed the play. And Sarah, who directed. So another round of applause for her, what she put together in a day. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> Let me make sure it's on. Um, as we said this afternoon, how does it feel like seeing that play read in New York by actors here? It's fun. It's, it's really fun. It's interesting to hear it because uh, <clears throat> in, in English it has a different touch than, than, than in German. It's a bit, uh, yeah, it kind of works like a well-made play, I guess, or some, somehow like that. It, uh, <laughs> That uh, we 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 uh, had something different in mind when we did it, but uh, we we then decided to make it really um, some uh, structurally uh, a well-made play, 
when we did, and so it was interesting to hear it. I think it it worked, and uh, not not too much was lost in translation, which is uh, which is very interesting and nice to see. So tell us a bit um, how. How, how did this play start? How did yeah. it, what was the origin of it? So uh, normally when we work with uh, Yael Ronan, um, it's uh, that we start out with one, um, with one topic. And the topic we started with was problems. And we wanted to call the play problems. And then we normally sit around and talk about problems. <laughs> so then later we changed it to Dark Side because the theater said problems is not a good title for a play. It's basically a stupid title because every play is about problems. So then uh, it was this idea of call it uh, dark side. And what we then do is, um, so most of, uh, most of the cast already knew Yael, and so we know a lot about each other from different, um, from different writing missions and from different plays. And so for the first weeks, we started out with a process of um, uh, what what energies we have in our minds and what 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 causes problems in us so then the first step was just so without having any play or any idea of what it will be about or anything uh, so we started out and uh, for the first week i guess we worked on write, writing down or trying to name um the voices we have in our heads who fuck us up and uh, which which are patterns that, we're, that, that constantly direct us, each and every one of us. And um, since uh, every work with her is personal and uh, we normally don't share anything which somebody else told, I just be, keep talking about myself and uh, how, how this, this part of, uh, so I played the part of Emmanuel. You created, was, was created developed. it, right? Uh, we, we created it, yes. <laughs> so basically then this, this, uh, this idea, and so um, then we, we started to, to develop those voices. And one voice in me uh, was this extremely cold, rationalizing dick, uh, which, which I am sometimes. And this, uh, this kind of, uh, I later read the term of, uh, of cosmic nihilism. So like believing in kind of nothing and everything is shit and human, hum, yeah, human beings are just, just the worst, yeah. So, uh, and, and reacting extremely cold and extremely rational on something. And then the, the parts was that other actors start to reenact certain situations that you have, but they uh, enact your voices in your head. So they, uh, and then they start and we try to figure out what are the most powerful voices in our heads. So we share with, with each other our problems. So uh, for some it was self-destruction, for, uh, for others it was, uh, uh, a strong and well, a kind of wicked uh, sexual desire, and so on and so on and so on. You sit at a table, then, or is that in the rehearsal room? Uh, that's in the rehearsal room. So sometimes we write, and then when when she has an idea, and say, okay, let's let's just prepare that and make an improvisation about that. So you have piece of paper and a pen uh, in front of you, and you write things sometimes, down. Sometimes, sometimes it's uh, it's some form of energy work <laughs> of uh, meditation that we do. Um, so, and so sometimes it's uh, some forms of ecstatic dancing and just finding out of where, where energies come from and so on and so on. And then uh, the, the thing was that the guy who was playing uh, Matthias, my brother, he was an acting student of mine. And he was this, this horrifically talented guy. <laughs> Uh, but uh, he kind of looks a bit like me and everybody in the theater said, and since I, I taught him, he also acts a bit like me. So we thought, oh, it's, it would be nice no matter what we do if we play brothers. So we decided, okay, we will play brothers. And then uh, they decided, okay, so then this, the, 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 the woman who was playing my wife, uh, with her I had already many plays and she had this, this, this thing which she once said in rehearsals that she's, um, kind of uh, sometimes uh, scared or repulsed by me. And, uh, so, so we thought, okay, that it would be nice that she will be my wife then in this play. And then uh, came the day and, and uh, through, through this whole process we uh, made, if, if somebody has any kind of you know, idea at home or, or comes uh, the next morning and says, well, I, I thought about that dark side, dark side, and maybe something with black holes. And then Stephen Hawking died, 
And since I am, uh, I was a very, very lonely child. And from the very beginning, I read, uh, I, I, I kind of got into theoretical astrophysics. So when uh, the day after Stephen Hawking died, Yael asked me, uh, can you do a speech about Stephen Hawking and what he was researching on and uh, in general talk about it. And then I started talking about Stephen Hawking and about uh, his uh, theories on black holes. And then we, we dug deeper and she started, okay, so what about dark matter and dark energy? And then out of that, because, because I, I talked about that, uh, we, we thought, hey, wouldn't it be fun if he, if Emmanuel was, an, was a physicist, uh, uh, physic, yeah, or a physica, yeah, I don't know, physicist, yeah, that's the, the right term, uh, a physicist. So this whole idea was born. And then we, we thought, but uh, since uh, this, this uh, beautiful, talented actor who plays my brother didn't know anything about physics, we thought, well, maybe he could also be a physicist, but you know somebody who makes YouTube stuff. <laughs> and so this, 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 this kind of th thing was developed. And then it was, I think, I guess about three weeks till opening night and we had no play <laughs> whatsoever <laughs> or anything. <laughs> So then we sat down and started writing this, this, this first scene, which we have basically, basically written in, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes. This first, when, when, they, when they start reacting on each other. And um, yeah, so, so then taking uh, also the personal stories and, and experiences and ideas of the other, of, of the other actors, um, those characters were developed. And then, while we rehearsed, we kept on writing new scenes, and then it's like three days until opening night, and we have no finish. And we're just sitting there and then say, okay, so what, what will happen, okay, if, if he knows? And then, uh, yeah, and this, this, this kind of process, so it's, uh, you always write against, against the little time you have. So the and black try. hole is swallowed that. The, the black hole swallowed, and yeah. then we just decided, yeah, Emmanuel deserves to be punished. And so, and so, Matthias, and so in, in our in our adaptation of this play, he beats me until I'm crippled, and in a wheelchair. Sorry. Yeah. Oh. So oh. this, and then <laughs> you become Stephen Hawking. Yeah. yeah. So I become Stephen Hawking. Yes. And then, and then the, this is the final punchline of my wife. Then, and she says, "Now you look like a real Nobel Prize winner," and this is how this whole play ends. This is German humor, it's okay? Very dark. Yes, it's very dark. Dark. It's yeah. not, so, um, Sara, I know you have to go at eight o'clock to catch your flight uh, out of JFK. Um, <laughs> what? So, Which gate is it? I don't know. I, um, have, can I'm you keep? Because I need. I don't even uh, yes. know. I think Do my C. confirmation number. Um, Thank you. So, uh, we asked you to have a look at the play, and uh, you said yes. So, uh, what, what sense did you make out of it? Well, it's so interesting to hear that there was another ending because, the, I mean, the ending that we had, that was the end, was the last thing where she's like... Yeah, because this was like two days. Uh, the, you have the text that was two days before opening night, so there was no ending, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and also some, some paragraphs are changed, and we, we, we really... Ch it's, it's really last minute changing, and some, some, sometimes, yeah, you, you even start out, and really even on the final day, when you know in the night we'll, we'll have an opening night, you still are rewriting texts or, or rehearsing really until the last minute, until people are coming in. Yeah. Um, that's amazing and sounds like a, such an, an amazing process. And I, um, I don't know, I wish I had known that about the end because I, I mean, uh, definitely look at when me. we yes, read I it. No, no, I, I mean, know, it's just I should so have known. fascinating. I um, and, and when we read it, we definitely all had the feeling of, okay, I guess that's, that's the end of the play. Um, and so then I asked uh, Michael to create something with this black hole, this yeah. image of the black hole, which is new, um, just to have some, the black hole is coming for us or something. Because yeah. I felt like something had to happen um, that was very dark. So I'm glad to hear that, that at least I could feel that. Um, yeah, um, it was. I, I, I'm, I'm crawling like five minutes on the ground and yelling, and ah, I can't move my legs. I can't move my legs. And then the the you, day. Do, the, the, do you want to do it? <laughs> you want to do it right now? <laughs> you can improvise. Okay? Just like fight choreo. You guys can do that. Also, if you guys wanted to join us, come, come also they're roommates, so they can totally pull it off. Um, so. Um, 
so what do you think of this? Is this a play? Uh, is it a Berlin play? Is that a, could that be done here? What do you what what, what do you think of the work? I I really uh, we I really loved it. We really had a lot of fun um, working on it. I think there's something about just the like matter of fact delivery of a lot of really dark material that was very satisfying. Um, uh, that I think. I don't know, sometimes there can be something in American theater where we feel like we have to, everything has to be very dramatic. Um, and if some something dark is revealed, it has to be received that way and sort of cause all this drama. And I, I just really appreciated that even though, you know, different forces in the play were causing problems, often those problems were received with, I mean, just Mania at the end being like, well, I don't know, yep, that's it, yep. You, he was fucking her, I don't know, bye. Like I, everyone's response or the conversation between David and Magda where they're like, yeah, yep. And we, but that's what it is, it, that's what it is to be human. You, sometimes you do want to kill yourself and it feels awful and we all experience that. Why do we have to make it into such a big deal? If know. you had one or two more days of rehearsal, <laughs> you might have come up. Uh, we might have come yes. up with that same ending. Oh, shit. I remember now. No, when we then drive home, there's another ending, actually, because there is still a phone call with the son, which was left home, and he cut himself open. This is, <laughs> this is the final thing. Oh my God. <laughs> Guys. This is German play. theater. It's so much fun. Amazing. <laughs> The kid so, dies at the end, and, so what, and the man is crippled. So what did you, what did, what, what did you have to wrestle with? What, what you felt was the complication, uh, what was uh, or challenging in the play for you? Um, I mean, and feel free to chime in, guys. Um, but I, yeah, I think we were trying to figure out what David was doing, sort of who, where he had come from, and what his role was, um, and. Um, how he knew what he knew, um, and and whether that was. I think we sort of came to that that was both a literal knowing, like that he could have somehow gotten a hold of someone's phone with his Google spy company. That was where we all went with it. Um, pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty, yeah. pretty much what, what we, we had. Yeah, so but that it was also something sort of metaphysical that yes. he just like sucked in information. So yes. it's hard to sort of get that in a reading, but yes. that's what we were, we had some conversations about that. But I, that's, cl I mean, it feels, after reading, we had to read it a few times, then we were like, ah, oh, I think this is what's going on. No, it, but, it yeah. was actually at, at one point, uh, a few days before opening night, there was still that he explains how he got this information, but then we felt now it gets a bit too well-made playish American. So somebody also, you know, <laughs> you have to explain everything. But so so we, we stayed with the, with, the, with the notion of that, that it should have still something met metaphysical that you can, you can guess it, by, but it's still unclear and in the dark. And also with the David character, there was this this idea because the demon of uh, of the actor was uh, the revenge demon. This uh, that that he has that he has really harsh revenge fantasies of, uh, and and he wanted to, so so we thought about about this guy who comes uh, yeah who comes to take revenge. I think we also yeah there felt like there was some layer of almost that he was a ghost, like because they hadn't known whether he was alive or not. Um, that for so long that they had been like, maybe he is dead, um, that there was sort of this layer of, yeah, he's a black hole, he's a person who works for Google spyware, and he's maybe a, not, he's dead. I don't know, you know? <laughs> they can be all true, <laughs> I, th I think. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, I also want to point out um, about the way um, the Gorka and this play, how the, how the company works. One could argue, of course, downtown companies have done that for a long time, which is true in ensemble work, uh, sharing, creating text um, together and doing this. But it is highly unusual in a theater like a Gorky, which is one of the four or five state uh, city theaters, that uh, this method of working is being transferred. It would be the same if saying, oh, like a musical in New York is being created and everybody can say, you know, ev the actor can say, I don't want to sing that song. I create my own, I write my own. Or they change something two days before or the day of the opening. It's unthinkable. As unthinkable this is also for a German city or state theater. It's as unthinkable as it would be for a New York director doing Daniel Fesch says, I want to change uh, the, uh, the uh, the Oklahoma ending a day before the opening. Can't do that. So I think one has to really see what the Gorky achieved in a way is to uh, create a new way of working, a new way of writing, and 
that is actually also successful. Like something comes out, something shines out of it. More energy comes out of that theater that gets in, even so you put in a lot of energy, of course, but something um, is working. And I think this is what a, a real significant message is. Everybody looks for the new writing, new this or that, but maybe it's the way of working in ensemble work. And maybe it is also the idea of having different languages on stage in the parallel universes. So I think this is something, even you jokingly say, oh, we do this or that, but it's a radical way of working, and it's also working, which I think is why it's so exciting to see that experiment going. So tell us, you wrote the monologues, right? Most probably, then the big ones. Yeah, and, and the scenes, so how did, yes. How did, and the scenes, so how does that work? Um, you just, Yael says, you know, write it, and then she, you, she, you perform it, and she says, yes, no. How, most of the time since, uh, so uh, Yael doesn't speak uh, German. She understands a little bit, but mostly we communicate in English. But she has a bit of dyslexia. So, so when she writes, really, she has five mista spelling mistakes in one word, literally. So you ha really have to, to know how, how to translate what, what she's doing, because she's just writing down intuitively. And um, so um, when, when we, uh, it, it depends whether we work on a scene in English or in German. So most of the time, if we work in German, um, we try to do that, that um, she basically says, or she, she brings a scene or says th these and those, uh, so, so those are, you know, the, the cornerstones of the scene, or, or maybe she writes down a few lines, and then we sit down and start to translate it to German, start to make it more precise to German, because of course she thinks in Hebrew, then translates it to English, writes it down in English, and we start to take it from, from her English, which is already condensed, and then inflate it again. To, to make a, a, a good and punchline-y German, German sentence of it. And sometimes it's also, or then I start ad-libbing and just, just say whatever comes to my head in rehearsals. And then she just looks to the dramaturg and says, is that, is that interesting, is that funny? And she says, yes, good, then we'll keep it. And then you, you continue doing it. Or also with, with monologues that she sometimes, that, that, that she just goes by energy, that she says, I, I don't know what you said there, but it feels wrong. And then, and then we just take it out because the energy doesn't feel right in there. So, and, and sometimes you really, f you're, you really sit for, for two days with the dramaturg and with her on, on a text and, and start to, to no, we need to put that sentence here, and we need to put that here, and to put that here. So it varies with uh, with with the content you're dealing with. So sometimes it's really super easy, or also with the scene where the two brothers talk. We've actually we've written the scene like ten minutes before we started rehearsing it, because yeah, it was the costume designer gave us costumes of 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 tennis, uh, yeah, like for a tennis match, because he wanted us to wear tennis clothes. And since everybody is respected, so you need to wear those costumes uh, that the costume designer gave to you. And then we said, okay, so maybe we should play tennis. Okay, then we, we just got tennis rackets, and, uh, but we had no ball. And then we just started, started doing those, those sounds, and then we had a bit of time left and said, okay, so now, now we need to do something. Okay, how do we get from this point that they have a normal conversation to the point of uh, him breaking down and saying, I, I, I hate her, I hate this woman. And then it's just really fast sitting together in the, in the wardrobe and, and us just improvising it and two people uh, writing the text down. And then we start to edit it because because we do an improv then of ten minutes maybe. So you don't videotape like Kastorf does. You write things down. We, uh, mo uh, some, sometimes it's videotaped. Sometimes if if it's a, a more physical scene, uh, sometimes it's just uh, the, the that the audio is taped. Uh, but but anyway, if we do those kind of improvisations, then there's. Uh, to two assistants who try to write it down, and then we re-edit it, or even while we uh, while we do the scenes, um, we we try to say no, maybe let's try today or to to put it this and that way. So it has uh, completely different forms from sometimes that it just works out well. Sometimes it's due to improvisation, and sometimes it's. Uh, really, really, really hard work, and it, it doesn't work out, and in the end, you throw it out. It's good that you have nine weeks to rehearse, right? There. But let me ask the question about the dramaturg you just mentioned. What yeah. is the role of the dramaturg? How does the role, in that specific 
Ray Vizial in Berlin at the Gorky at that moment. So how, how, what is the role of the dramaturg? How, what does he or she do? Um, since uh, the, this, the, uh, uh, you, you have to be very, very, um, yeah, the, 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 the problem is, uh, and this I always find, when, when a director who comes from a different cultural background but uh, does something for a certain kind of, 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 of scene, so for example in Berlin, um, it's sometimes important to know that some sentences or some words or something you say or do have certain connotations to people, you know, the, the codes you use. And so uh, in this case, the dramaturg is a very, very vital, yeah, yeah, it's a very important position of if we do something which is, uh, and, and say some German sentences which are not really translatable, but she tries then to explain it to the director, the dramaturg who've worked with her for over 10 productions, 15 I think now, and she tries to explain to her this is why, and the other way around, so she knows uh, the, the, where, where yeah, Ronan has her cultural background and then tries to reflect it to us. And so this is very, very, very important and really to edit the text and to just say, because if you try, so sometimes it's difficult as an actor even to rehearse something and then to listen to somebody else from the outside and to say, no, this doesn't work. But if you at the same time trying to make up the text or even so, so you're, you're at the same time the author, the the, the co-director and uh, an actor which in the next scene should be completely open to the suggestion of what the director wants, you, you get completely, yeah, you, you, you're betriebsblind, I don't know. So how come it's said written by Jal Ronan if it's an ensemble work? It's, 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 uh, it's always uh, Jal Ronan and ensemble. And so, so do you get royalties? Uh, we, we no, we 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 uh, we now try to to say that um, we're we're trying to make it with the theater. How yeah, we try to develop it because actually, since this kind of work is so new, um, it's really it's really it's it's a big question, and this is also something we try out and to be to do some pioneering work in in the theater landscape because actually this is a very very complicated matter. What Yael, for example, does with each and every one of her play, if it's in a festival and it gets, uh, it gets uh, awards or money, um, she shares the money with everybody, also with the assistants uh, who, who worked on this play. But it's very, very difficult with, with royalties because then the question is uh, how much is a quotation and if somebody, like, like in my position, and I actually write those texts, but other uh, actors don't write the texts, but uh, the, the texts get, get written and so and then on. Then who so has to be asked? Can we perform it? Can we not? Exactly. Do we have the rights? Exactly. So this, has is so this is a complicated field. We don't have to get into it, but it's yeah. also something that arises. Also, we had a big session here at the Siegel Center with the new dramatists, uh, with the Dramatists Guild. You know, there are big questions that come, come out of that, big, of a new work that raises a completely new question, which I think shows something is really happening. I really would like to have the actors come over here um, and we started without you guys, um, so maybe we hear your voice. I, I hope you all agree. And yes. Can I, yeah. I want to introduce everybody. Yeah. This is Paul Ketchum, Mike Mikos, David Gould, Hannah Mitchell, and Kate Schrader. Yay. Yeah. Hey, and can I ask one question yes. too? Do you, so the nine week development period, are people paid for that whole period? Uh, yeah, or paid. the rehearsals? Yes. How much do you rehearse? Uh, every day for, it, it depends on sometimes we just rehearse for one hour a day. Uh -huh. uh, sometimes it's eight, nine hours. But, but we have, as, as for me, I have a fixed contract. So, so right. the theater pays me no matter whether, whether I work or don't work. They yeah. still pay Yeah, me. that's amazing. And I just want to say that as to these people and to the people because that doesn't exist here. And so I think when you say, right, it's so amazing, they're making this work this way, it would be like da-da-da-da-da happening on Broadway, that's why it doesn't happen here, and that's why it can't happen here, is because there's not funding for it to work in that way, and it's so frustrating, because I love working that way, and I worked with Elevator Repair Service, which is one of the closest companies that we have like that, where people are devising things over a really long period of time with a, a, an ensemble, yeah. um, and that all that work is credited to, it's by Elevator Repair Service. Um, but that's, it's almost impossible to make yeah. that happen here. Anyway. Yeah. 
No, the, but, but, but this is why I said it, it's, uh, this, since it's a, a state theater or a city theater, so the city subsidizes the, the whole work. So, so about 80 to 90% of the theater is subsidized by, by the state. So just, just the last 10% are actually through uh, ticket sales. Which but is, one which can is also argue um, they subsidize it even if no ensemble member is included in the creating the work. You know, then it's just the director yeah. or the drummer. Yeah, so yeah. it's not that they can rehearse longer because of this. The times are similar. But I would like to go to the ensemble and just ask them how did it feel doing this play? And also, here you were like American actors. You had to roll. You had to read it. And how how does it feel to hear how they cr created it? You know. The, so um, I'll maybe uh, hand the mic over. Whoever wants to say something about it. Uh, I, I feel like this is definitely the way that I always want to uh, work on a play, is, uh, yes, exactly what you described, <laughs> <laughs> Dimitri. Uh, and like performing the play, certainly I had that sense. And in, in fact, uh, the way that you were describing the development process, about how it was like on different days you were feeling different things, and then you would make that scene on that particular day. There are so many scenes that have that that feeling, especially with Emmanuel. Uh, like uh, the lectures feel so substantially different than when he's interacting with Matthias during the tennis scene. Yeah. it's like the 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 tenor of the character changes completely from scene to scene, uh, which is so great because I feel like all the time when I'm an actor, it's like I need to have some motivation that persists throughout the entire show that takes me all the way to the end, instead of just being like a human being where, you know, from day to day, I completely change the way that I interact with the world. Yeah. Yeah. Any other comments? Um, I, yeah. I, I also agreed, like, um, that I think Sarah maybe said it earlier that there was so much humor in the play as we started digging. I mean, I think on our, our first read, like, all of the darkness and the problems were very apparent. But um, yeah, I feel like the dialogue and the humor and the sort of, it, it felt, I, I, was, um, I was very struck by how natural the dialogue felt and how sort of like organic and lived in those relationships felt, even though it had been translated how many ever, you know, when you're saying it's been translated many times. And um, so that felt very apparent to me that you guys had actually spent a lot of time kind of just inhabiting these roles and exploring what they were and then spontaneously trying to capture some aspect of those relationships. Um, I thought that was really cool and successful in this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, seething with envy uh, just <laughs> <laughs> hearing a description of this process. Um, like she was saying about, you know, working with translations. We, I think, uh, on a first read, second read, in you know the short time we had, we're like, okay, we can tell that a that there's we knew that there were other languages used in the production, which we're setting aside for now, or in English, we know that there's probably something lost in the uh, punchlines. We know that like, and to uh, to hear you describe a process with a dramaturg and people that speak these languages and people that not only speak the language but understand the connotations and the jokes and the the full texture of that is um, it, it's um, we rarely get a chance when we're working with translated plays to we we trust the translator who is rarely in the room. Mm -hmm. It's usually you know Paul Schmidt, whoever is who did the thing, and you're like, well, I guess you know, and you know to take the time and, and go back to source material because of course we're Americans, we only speak English anyway. Just <laughs> just, uh, just to put in also just sorry to to say the Gorky Theater. Even if the play is in German, they will have always subtitles for every page. They do not assume that everybody speaks or understands German. It would be like saying here every play that even is in English language will have subtitles mm -hmm. in Spanish, for example. And that's a significant idea, I think. So it's, uh, sorry. Yeah. I just want to say one other thing: yeah. that the, the idea of taking a, a costume design that's been like worked on independently and incorporating that—that's so uh, insanely cost inefficient. Uh, we would never, I mean, I have worked that way with uh, with companies where it's like a shoestring budget and we, you know, kind of, like we don't have a play but we have a sound design and we're gonna start from there. That is so, uh, it, like just such an enriching place to begin and it's uh, so rare. So I'm hoping that as you iron out your process in Berlin and figure out uh, who gets paid and for what, 
and how the money works that you'll like send us the model when you're done with it because <laughs> we sorely need it. I mean, we don't get to play like that because uh, nobody's going to spend the money on a costume design. Be like, what? Tennis? We're not doing tennis. You know, that's the end of yeah. the conversation. So it's, anyway. Uh, also for, for the translation, I need to, to, to add, for example, a, f a few details because now that you, you've mentioned it and, and how much you trust the translator. So for example, um, the, the woman who was playing my wife, so, so your part, um, she speaks um, um, a German which is okay, but she, since she moved from Israel to Germany about six years ago, her German is very bad. So when she tries to improvise it or, or tries to say something, so you write out the, the line in English and what she, what she said in the first moment, we've written down. So it's, it's bad German, but it's very interesting how it's structured. So it gets a very natural point. And of course, hearing that in, in uh, well-written English is something completely different also for, for, also for a couple where you have just the, the d disadvantage of somebody who, who, who has the power of language uh, above somebody else. And then if she's really, she gets really angry at him, she, she switches uh, to Hebrew and starts insulting him, him in Hebrew. And the David character, um, he also, since he, he, he was, was raised by, by Amish Talibanish uh, wolves in, in, in Israel. Um, he he also speaks a, a very very strange form of German mixed with some Dutch accent with some British accent, and it's very very interesting. So that there are two people who are immediately even if they just just later on they start speaking Hebrew with each other, but from the very beginning they have some form of mutual understanding. But this is due to to the fact that you don't try to you know flatten down and, and make it everything into perfect German, which normally in Germany, Germans love German culture. <laughs> so so it's, it's, it's difficult, you know, to, to break this down, but the possibilities that you then have all of a sudden are so, are so huge and so subconscious, uh, and work on a subconscious level, which isn't even, you know, really, really translatable. But still, to hear that, that, that those, those scenes, all of a sudden, if it's written in, in, in perfect English, and then to hear that, that it makes sense on another level, but, but other problems emerge from that. And then it's, it, it was so, um, uh, I was really happy to hear that and to hear, whoa, this, this text kind of works if it is actually translatable, uh, not, not in the sense that it's just in a different language, but even if it's in a different language and you have those forms of, you know, ironed out, it still works and makes sense. This is uh, something really, really astonishing to hear. Yeah. Before we come to audience question, also a question to you. How personal really is the work? Because you do have a brother, and he works in the f creative field also. Yeah. Um, do you work through personal things, or do you say, oh, it's just a guy, I know, he's an actor, we work through it. How, how deep does it really go? Um, in some parts, really, really deep. Um, so also in this in this form of work, we had we had another production with Yael, which prim, which had an opening night recently, and where an actor a few days before the opening night refused to play it and said this is now too too personal or too close, uh, and uh, also in other processes, this is the first thing Yael usually says to the actors. So as soon as you, you have to take care of yourself, so as soon as you have the feeling of not being able to, to say something, um, y you do it. Or in another play which we did, which was called Denial, uh, I, I had a monologue which was fictional, but about uh, when I come, come, come clean about my father uh, who, 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 was, who was molesting me sexually as a child. Yeah? And she wanted me to do it, uh, parts of it in Russian since I have a Russian background and also the audience knows that uh, yeah, I'm, I'm Russian. And I refused to do that, and said, "No, this is this is too close. So this would make it make would make me feel uncomfortable. Really, the notion that my father who might come to see this play, uh, and uh, then so so you always try to touch those lines of 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 reality of of merging it, but sometimes you really need to take care of not not crossing this line." And and sometimes uh, yeah, El can do it. Sometimes you need to do it with your fellow colleagues who, who try to work on that with you. 
just to say that sometimes you just open up de you know, the, the, the portal to your demons, which is completely not healthy. Because as much as it's, it's and it's great, it's really, really great um, to, to be in, in a cast and people who are willing to share deep personal secrets, um, personal scars, h horrific things they lived through or they, they made other people live through. But at some points you really need to be careful that it doesn't cross this line. And sometimes it even does with some people because they were not too careful or you didn't see it coming and they just realize it later on or you really feel like shit while doing this production which really really bothers you or opens something up and and people you know and you need them to to help with uh, with a therapist or something like that and so sometimes the work is really, really personal. Sometimes you play with the notion that it's personal, but most of the time it's it's like with uh, yeah with with authors, even though they they wouldn't you know perform in their own stuff. But of course you let you you write what you know. And yes, I have a brother who is highly successful, and we work together. So he's a filmmaker and uh, won won a student academy award for a movie which I've written. And so we, we constantly fight, and this is, this is a thing I know. And so I, it's, it's fun to write those scenes because I know it. I know how to handle it. And, and this, this, of course, then, then comes down to that. At sometimes you, al uh, uh, you also write texts which are too much to handle for the audience or also for the other colleagues, which is just that you say, okay, thank you for sharing, but we'll just put it somewhere there. <laughs> and then some, maybe someday we'll do another play and we'll take those texts out again and say, so now it fits. And this is, this is a very, very interesting, a very interesting process also to think that it's not for this one play, but it can develop. And even if in 10 years we'll do another play about, about something completely different, we will remember, oh, but you had this great text then about you fantasizing about raping your mother. Would you be so kind to bring that to the stage? And then we'll do a scene because it's German theater. Yeah, well, <laughs> so in a way, Yell is like the doctor in the play who kind of say it tense and relax, looks at the tongue, and then what are the thresholds of pain? Yes. So, and in the nut house uh, of life. Um, so, um, uh, Zara has to go to catch her plane. Thank you again. At JFK, where? Lisbon. Oh. Lisbon, yes. Um, what are you doing there? Why? Uh, oh, your car key. The, the vintage car key, yeah. So, um, yeah, so maybe, uh, Mike, uh, if possible, let's have some light on the audience. Uh, we need to give one mic back. Uh, oh, you have one? Okay. So um, uh, we're a little bit over time, but I thought it was kind of a, 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 a good uh, a, a discussion. So we, we go a little bit over it. So we start. Yeah. We go one and then two here. Um, uh, we were in Berlin uh, last December, I think, or perhaps it, we, we were there twice last year. I'm not sure when we did this, but we went to the Gorky and we saw the situation. We saw you in it, yes. um, and uh, I loved it. I thought it was a fantastic play, and I thought it was an important play to show to a city like New York that has a big immigrant population, and I could imagine it being done here at one of our nonprofit theaters, like the public or something like that, the public theater. Um, but I'm wondering how you guys would feel about it being performed by other actors, not by your company, but by another set of actors. I mean, you saw other people performing this play here, what would it be like? I mean, that would, that would have to be done, I would assume, with the original languages because it's about language. But how would you feel about it being performed by a, a different cast? With this play, I would, very, I would have no, no, no problems at all with the situation, which is a, a play um, where I also have a monologue and talk 20 minutes about my family coming from the Soviet Union to Germany. And this, this would be something I wouldn't allow for somebody else mm -hmm. to do. This would is is something which which would be too too personal or too direct or I wouldn't want somebody else to interfere with that. But uh, other parts we could we could probably do. But but I think this is this is something that from from play to play you would have to decide whether it's something that you want to you want to give up and you want people to to cover your stuff and maybe 
yeah, but but with with other things, maybe it's too it's too personal, or you you want to keep it with you. Or a New York actor might have to dig in himself you by the casting, you know, tell their own stories. Um, yeah. and uh, in a what if that's thinkable, I don't. I don't, I, know. I don't know if if Joaquin Phoenix would play me. I would say, okay, <laughs> just go ahead and yeah. just just do it. <laughs> <laughs> do the monologue, man. Yes. <laughs> or, good. Everybody's got a price, right? Um, I, you, I mean, you talked about the development process leading, like in, in the case of this play, like literally it sounded like up to the first curtain on opening night. I'm curious about what happens after that. Is the play fixed from opening night or does the development continue? Um, and then I know as a, if you're a rep company, sometimes these things will stay in rep for a very, very, very long time. Um, does this text stay the same through cast changes? Do the productions get revived many years down the line with a completely new cast, and then is there a new development process? Um, could you talk a little about that? Yeah, if it's if it's personal, then then yes, and most of the time we do it that there's still some kind of of, of process that you you start again with with working with other people, but but going through the same process, but maybe in a shorter time. Sometimes it doesn't really matter if the the, the scenes are well written, for example, and it's not a personal monologue or a personal story. Sometimes people. Uh, who leave the company also say, I don't want somebody else to play my text, so you need to, to have the scenes changed. Um, so this is, this is uh, something you need to deal, uh, and um, for, for the second question, uh, for the first question, uh, yeah, it, sometimes it does develop, um, if if we do more political plays, who, who you know uh, have, have connections to, to, to current events, and sometimes you just need to change it and to say, okay, we, we talk about uh, Syrian city being occupied by ISIS, but it's not occupied anymore, so we need to change it now. Mm -hmm. So, and this this is something we do we do in the we do sometimes in the process, or also if the play is you know released just just on on very short notice, yeah, or how do you say it, yeah, so kurzfristig, yeah, and then sometimes you know after five or six performance we meet again and say no, you know this scene doesn't work, but if we maybe we could we could do a rewrite on that, mm -hmm. and then we just rewrite it and try it out, mm -hmm. so this is also a, a great possibility then to to do it and to change it. Last question. Yeah. I love your fearless development process where you just jump in. That's, that's uh, really intriguing. I'm interested in Magda's, uh, uh, how her uh, character was developed, especially the suicide and the, and the cutting. I, I do a lot of documentaries with people who, who have uh, been in suicide watch wards and have been in mental hospitals, and that was very convincing. I was wondering if Yale had a, that was a self-portrait or how that was developed. Uh, as I said in the beginning, it's difficult to, to say about the process of other people because we try to keep it confidential, but uh, it was mostly, mostly those things, the, the actress who played it, she, she brought it, um, and she, she, she uh, yeah, brought many texts about that and many ideas about that. So th this was not due to Yael, but due to the actress who, who developed the part of, of Magda. Maybe one or two more comments or questions. Jim? Uh. Um, I have a question about the evolution of the Gorky Theater and its repertoire. Um, the first time that I was there was about, I think, 2009, and I saw a very radical production of Danton's death, but it was still Danton's death. And then I didn't come back for a number of years. The next thing I saw was Third Generation, which was just absolutely stunning, which seems it's much more in line with what we're seeing in this piece. Was there a conscious break when the company said, no, we're going to do something totally different? Or was it more of a gradual change? Or do the older works somehow come back sometimes? The Maybe Christopher can uh, Yeah, Christopher can answer. Um, well, I mean, uh, uh, to say who you are. I am. Uh, hi, I'm Christopher. I'm a part of the artistic uh, leadership team at the Gorky. Um, so, to, uh, well, 2009, it was a completely different artistic uh, director. It was Amin Petras. Uh, 
And uh, the new leadership by Shamin Langhoff and Jens Selye was in 2013. So um, yeah, yes, there was a, uh, let's say, radical change because you already have a very different t artistic team and uh, a very different ensemble structure. Because um, usually uh, in Germany you have either, if, if you appoint an artistic director or an artistic team, it's basically uh, five or to ten, up to ten years um, that the artistic director takes over with an ensemble. And uh, usually when that changes, also the structure of the ensemble and the ensemble members changes. And uh, yes, it was, it was very completely different. The, the older, I mean, Petra's era was uh, very much focused on, a, um, on, a th on, on making theater plays that were very contemporary, especially of uh, German contemporary uh, writers. And uh, with Shamil Langhoff and Jens Hilje, we had this very, we, or we still have, this very diverse uh, ensemble uh, with many different faces. And uh, in 2013, uh, very fresh faces even for the German theater scene. So, yes. <laughs> so I think we're getting really close to them. It's almost two hours, because normally everybody says, Frank, never do anything more than 90 minutes, you know, in New York. <laughs> so uh, that just shows this was really an inspiring reading and a great play. So what are you working uh, on now um, when you go back? I know we were lucky to catch you in a break, but what is... What's on the plate for the Gorky, or were you involved in? Uh, with the Gorky, I, I take a, a small a small break because it, it has taken its toll on me. Do you say yeah, that? Yeah, is? Yeah. Oh, my we don't see so it, but good. if you say so. <laughs> no, it's really uh, what, what I have to say, and this is really a, a downside of working like that. It really fucks you up because <laughs> because I, I've played in the last six years. I've played more than 100 shows each season while rehearsing five new plays each season. And while writing the, 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 uh, the, those, those things and to try to, you know, be, the, going through those processes. And it's, it, after, after a while, it, it's really, really, really tough to do that. <laughs> no, it, in the beginning it is. Yeah. It, but, but then after, after a while in, in, this, in this working heaven, it's, it's, uh, so, so now I'm, I'm taking a small break and not doing any new, per, uh, so I'll continue doing the performances. Uh, but Yael is working on a play about witchcraft right now and they it's do. Uh, yeah, it's uh, called Rewitching Europe. Yeah. Or this is the working title we're working on. We uh, did a two week workshop with her. Um, and we're actually renovating the theater right now. So the main stage is actually already closed. Um, we're still doing some uh, stuff in the studio until mid of June. And then we have uh, our regular summer break. And uh, we're actually building a black box container in front of the theater, which uh, holds 200 people. And then we return with the main stage in September. and. I think it's going to be an exciting and full season because we're actually um, doing also the, the uh, Autumn Saloon, it's called. It's also part of, so we have regular premieres coming up uh, for the next season alongside the repertoire that we're playing. And then we have uh, a festival, basically, uh, or like an like a exhibition also in, uh, in, in Autumn with 30 artists um, who are showing their works in, in the theater. And we're, we're having guest performances there also. Um, and yeah, we'll see what will happen. It's, we have a lot of program coming up. Amazing. <laughs> I thought we do a lot here at the Siegel, but you know, that's uh, <laughs> it's so much more next to the 40 plays they have in repertoire. I mean, you just have to imagine that. So I, again, um, really thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Really, thank you for the energy you put in and the time in this. Uh, it truly uh, uh, reading that I think caught the soul of that play, that dark, dark uh, matter. Mm -hmm. I would like to invite you all to come around the corner. We are on the Archive Bar, as I said before. It's between the 30. It's on 36th Street, because between Fifth Avenue and. Uh, and medicine, are you going to guys going to come for a moment too? Yes. Yes, with some drinks. So if you have additional questions, again, thank you for coming. And I think really uh, this is one of the great things of Penwell Voices that 
things are flowing around and that we are exposed to ideas. And also, um, as we just said, we spent a time with someone who cut and tried to kill herself. And we felt something uh, about it and we learned something. So thank you so much and I uh, hope to see you in the two other days. Thank you. Thank you.